I once cosplayed as Mulan in Nankinmachi, a Chinatown in Kobe, Japan. Famous for its food stands and festivals, and usually bustling with crowds of people, both tourists and locals alike. So, where were the usual crowds? This was back in March of 2020, when COVID-19 had started to spread exponentially throughout the world. But I promise you that in a country where there never was a true lockdown, where people lined up in throngs for frappuccinos during a state of emergency, that they were not socially distancing. Or can we say physically distancing? Because in Japan, I feel like it's been more physical than social. Like most businesses have still been open, just seating has either been scattered with signs or cute stuffed animals or sectioned off with plastic barriers. I miss physical touch so much. Sometimes I just give myself a hug, which incidentally is also a great stretch to relieve shoulder pain. Also, can it still be considered social distancing if I went to a restaurant, but knew I'd be able to stay two meters away from other diners? But how did I know this? What was a source of my confidence? I knew these Chinatown restaurants would be largely empty because A, I saw a pretty heart-wrenching post by vlogger and YouTuber on the world stage sharing the struggles of one Chinese restaurant in Nankimachi. And B, there was a similar sharp decline in Chinatowns all over the globe news of the novel coronavirus first broke. When looking at how empty these Chinatowns were compared to other neighborhoods all over the world prior to shelter at home orders, there is another more insidious explanation. A secondary effect of coronaviruses and infectious diseases in general, xenophobia. And we have seen this before, basically with every major outbreak throughout human history. We saw it in the 14th century with the Black Death, when Jewish communities were blamed for poisoning wells and causing the plague, and were subsequently massacred throughout Europe. We saw it in the 19th century with cholera in New York, when Irish Catholic immigrants were accused of causing the outbreaks. We saw it in the early 20th century in San Francisco, when the Chinese community was blamed for essentially every epidemic that hit the city, resulting in the Chinese Exclusion Act the first anti-immigration law in America based on ethnicity or nationality. We saw it in 2003 in Toronto with SARS and the stigmatization of Asian Canadians. We saw it in 2014 in the US and Europe with Ebola when examples of Ebola hysteria were growing too numerous to count. And we are seeing it now in 2021 throughout the world with COVID-19. As surreal and unprecedented as 2020 was, there had been moments of deja vu Honestly, at this point, I would not bat an eye if Agent Smith shows up. <laughs> and oh, I would have complaints. Design your matrix better. I don't have many memories of the SARS outbreak. I was more worried about starting high school and being one of the cool kids, being accepted, or at least not rejected. But one thing I recall vividly is reading a sign in front of my family's favorite Korean barbecue restaurant run by Koreans, which read, we are not Chinese. And I remember feeling a surge of shame as a fellow Korean Canadian. But now, as we witness history being repeated nearly two decades later, my perspective has evolved. And I believe that that sign, as well as recent racist incidents, ranging from microaggressions to violent attacks, have several forces at work behind them. No, layers. Racism is like onions or ogres. They all have layers. So let's start peeling. There are several reactions humans tend to have in the midst of a disease outbreak, including, as history has repeatedly shown, xenophobia. And while no acts of hatred or prejudice can be justified, nor should ever be normalized, as one university so casually tried to do, knowledge is one thing, acceptance is another. It's important to understand this tendency, this knee-jerk reaction of dividing ourselves into groups and casting blame. One theory as to why racism and prejudice is so often a response to disease outbreaks is based on psychology and optimism bias. The cognitive bias that causes individuals to believe that they themselves are less likely to experience a negative event. 
This phenomenon is behind the conviction we have when we speed, hoping we won't get a ticket. The belief that whispers, it won't happen to me. And when it comes to infectious diseases, this bias becomes easier when separating society into groups by thinking race or ethnic or religious background as opposed to species, we can feel as though we're distancing ourselves from an outbreak. And there is a pattern when you take a look at the communities that have been blamed in the past. As history professor Alan Kraut explains, whenever there's a crisis like an epidemic, people immediately look for who to blame. And groups that have already been stigmatized are natural targets. I mean, Black communities were the target of centuries of racist pseudoscience, which likened living, breathing, loving human beings to animals in order to justify the institution that was a North American slave trade. Even President Obama wasn't exempt. <sighs> I love puns, so why isn't it funny? Irish Catholic immigrants were also once victims of intense discrimination, once perceived as an inferior race compared to Anglo-Saxons, and often turned away from employment and housing. This is in part because this was also the period of the Second Great Awakening, of intense Protestant evangelism, and Catholics were always the target of that. They attributed the presence of the epidemic to the filthiness and ignorance of Irish Catholic immigrants. And Chinese immigrants, at once exploited for cheap labor and resented for stealing jobs like the Irish, provided the opportunity for Caucasian immigrants to overcome their religious differences and band together based on skin color. So I guess a solution to racism would be if we had an alien species against whom we could discriminate in unity. No. No. Mm, no. Oh my god, no. Ooh, he may not be an alien, but he's perfect. The discrimination against Chinese immigrants was so prevalent that regardless of the topic, Irish immigrant and leader of the Working Men's Party ended every speech with, and whatever happens, the Chinese must go. So in the 1800s, the Chinese community was blamed not only for epidemics, but for problems in general. In the words of one physician writing in 1876, the Chinese were the focus of Caucasian animosities and they were made responsible for mishaps in general. A destructive earthquake would probably be charged to their account. And yeah, Jewish communities have been persecuted throughout human history. Like since the Greco-Roman era. But there is a counterproductive effect of racializing outbreaks. Coronaviruses are zoonotic, meaning that they jump from species to species. When a coronavirus affects humans as a species, it will not discriminate based on that 0.1% difference in our DNA, based on the color of our skin, our hair, or eyes. Though, sidebar, how we discriminate amongst ourselves affects the distribution and the severity of the virus along ethnic lines, likely due to differences in access to and trust in healthcare, as well as differences in the probability of working and or living in overcrowded conditions. COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted communities of color. However, the virus itself doesn't know ethnic boundaries. So if you are stuck with this perception that there are only certain groups of people you need to keep a distance from, you miss the more important part of keeping distance from other potential carriers. As tempting as it may be, telling ourselves that a disease is more likely to be spread by certain ethnic groups provides a false and dangerous sense of security among others. As environmental studies professor Roger Keel summarized, racism is a weapon of mass infection. A second theory behind the racialization of outbreaks and the us versus them mentality is based on evolution. According to Stephen Taylor, author of The Psychology of Pandemics, preparing for the next global outbreak of infectious disease, heading back as far as we know, the racialization of outbreaks is partly because human beings are tribalistic in nature. We are socialized to evolve in small groups. And because most of the important infectious diseases that wiped out groups of people were brought in by foreigners, if you think about Europeans settling in the Americas who brought influenza and smallpox, which wiped out the indigenous people. So, we as humans, to some extent, have a built-in xenophobia. 
which may have made sense prior to globalization, but less so with the scale and ease with which humans have been able to travel and migrate in the 21st century. Airplanes are pretty magical, although a TARDIS would be ideal right now. Doctor, we need you. And just as our technology has evolved beyond the wildest dreams of our tribal ancestors, hopefully so too can we evolve beyond tribal mentality. However, evolution takes time. So in the meanwhile, let's go back to that sign during SARS. We are not Chinese. Those words, which caused shock and shame at the age of 13, seem more comprehensible now at the age of 31. Holy shit, I'm 31. That went by really quickly. On two levels. On one level, when the financial reality was that so many Chinese operated businesses saw huge drops in foot traffic during the SARS outbreak, including up to 80% in Toronto. And when newspapers would print shit like this. I can now understand, from an economic standpoint, the instinct to distance oneself. It's not something to be condoned, but something I can empathize with once I learned the struggles of making a living, of working for, you know, those annoying necessities like rent and food, and less annoying essentials like certain kinds of food and beer. Also, did you know the daily consumption of alcohol compromises your immune system? On another level, the fact that these Korean restaurant owners felt the need to distance themselves from Chinese immigrants in the first place could be attributed to a deeper current of racism in Western countries, towards Asians in general, to the extent that some are ignorant of or choose to ignore the differences between Asian cultures. And the fact that the Center for Disease Control had to step in and clarify that people of Asian descent are not more likely than others to spread the novel coronavirus was a testament to the recent flare in anti-Asian racism. It is important to remember that people, including those of Asian descent, who do not live in or have not recently been in an area of ongoing spread of the virus that causes COVID-19, or have not been in contact with a person who is a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19, are not at greater risk of spreading COVID-19 than other Americans. The fact that they had to clarify that is just... <sighs> words. English. Can't. Can't words. Can't English right now. Oh, no. Here's a word. Unbelievable. However, the severity and frequency of these anti-Asian racist attacks and incidents and the physical nature of some assaults reveal a deeper issue which I believe has nothing to do with COVID-19 itself. Case in point, if you were really concerned about someone spreading a virus to you, would you really touch them with your bare hands? Wouldn't you at least put on a glove before punching them or stabbing them? While it's difficult to even try to understand the motivations of someone who attempted to murder a toddler or of those who have murdered the elderly in vicious and cowardly attacks, unless they were literally Voldemort. These acts of violence, as well as microaggressions, indicate a latent racism against Asian diasporas, the members of which are racialized in a uniquely ambiguous manner. A psychotherapist, Hua Xu, points out, within a racial paradigm that positions black and white as opposing poles, those who, like Asian Americans, don't fit on either side, occupy a state of flux and can be recast as good or bad, depending on the political mood, becoming an alien threat one moment and a model minority the next. And the myth of Asian immigrants as a model minority attributes the Asian American success story to cultural traits like Confucian values on education and family, overlooking the fact that in 1965, US immigration policy started a selective recruitment based on high education and the reunification of families. This myth of the Asian model minority is harmful in and of itself by one, tending to focus on high status Asian subgroups and ultimately leading to the struggles of other subgroups, such as refugees, being ignored by policymakers and the public alike. And by two, 
making a flawed comparison between Asian Americans and other groups, particularly Black Americans, to argue that racism, including more than two centuries of Black enslavement, can be overcome by hard work and strong family values. So, basically by undermining the impact of structural racism over human lives. But the model minority myth can also foster a common misconception by creating a distorted image of Asians, which overestimates Asian white income equality. And this misconception can be dangerous insofar as to incite violence when combined with another distortion, the perception of foreignness. One model of racial positioning proposes that there are two axes of racial and ethnic disadvantage, perceived inferiority and perceived cultural foreignness, locating the four largest groups in the U.S. in four quadrants. Whites are perceived and treated as superior and American, African Americans as inferior and relatively American compared with Latinos and Asian Americans, Latinos as inferior and foreign, and Asian Americans as foreign and relatively superior compared to African Americans and Latinos. So Asian looking people are often seen as foreigners, regardless of where they were born or how many generations of their families have been in the U.S. A constant outsider, a perpetual other. This perception of foreignness, combined with a misconception of Asians as successful by default, can explain the anti-Asian sentiment which lies dormant during times of calm and flares up during times of crisis. An echo of the hostility in the 19th century, when Chinese immigrants were resented and eventually attacked in the largest mass lynching in America for being job-stealing coolies, foreigners with a big piece of a pie to which they have no claim. An ideal target for misdirected fear and anger during a disaster like COVID-19. But maybe that sign, we are not Chinese, wasn't just an attempt to clarify that it was a Korean restaurant operated by Koreans. Maybe that sign was also a racist microaggression. Because when we sift through the general anti-Asian racism, we can clearly see fear and discrimination specifically towards Chinese communities, as well as individuals of Chinese heritage all over the world, including Asia. And it gets personal. Like when two Chinese tourists were told to leave a restaurant in Japan. <laughs> Sinophobia, this particular hatred and fear towards Chinese people, could be rooted in an underlying consciousness, if not a niece, towards the rise of China's economic and political growth, a topic concerning political scientists for decades, and is reflected in popular culture, both subtly, as in with the alliance, the interplanetary government born from the Union of the United States and the People's Republic of China, and less subtly. That kind of racism is exactly why I can't wait to see tiny little Chinese boots on your white ass necks. Which may sound hypocritical, I know, but... And though the gesture made by the CDC to educate the American public was, well, intentioned and noble, it was likely offset by politicians and news outlets constantly referring to the novel coronavirus as the China virus or Kung Flu, including the former president of the United States. And I cannot believe what I'm about to say, but I actually empathize with Donald Trump. Huh. You don't need me to tell you that COVID-19 has been a life-changing catastrophe on a global scale. Described by the UN chief as humanity's worst crisis since World War II. No one wants to be held accountable for this. I didn't do it. However, when a nation's leader insists on calling COVID-19 the China virus, such a choice in words leads to real impact at the ground level in the day-to-day -day lives of citizens, including shit like this. This man came up to me and he said, Trump says all Asians have coronavirus, you disgusting 
Every disease has ever came from China, homie. Everything comes from China. It's a disgusting. I mean, yeah, he's got a point. Most of our manufacturing goods come from China, as do one of the most widely accepted writing systems, paper making, printing, the compass, gunpowder, the crossbow, and noodles. Like beautiful, sexy ramen. However, given that this is the second time a major international coronavirus outbreak has apparently originated in China, let's examine the what and the why. What caused the novel coronavirus, COVID-19? as well as its predecessor, SARS. And why did they originate in China? In 2002, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, infected 8,437 people and killed 813 in 26 countries. SARS coronavirus, which causes the SARS disease and which is thought to be an animal virus from an as yet uncertain animal reservoir, perhaps bats, that spread to other animals, civet cats, and first infected humans in the Guangdong province of southern China. Today, coronavirus 2019, or COVID-19, has brought the world to its knees, killing over 2 million people as of February 14, 2021. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which causes COVID-19, is thought to have jumped from bats to pangolins to humans. One thing is likely, though animal to human transmission for both viruses began in wildlife wet markets in China. Now, the wet in wet market can sound off-putting, even gross and scary, unlike moistly, which just sounds gross and funny. That prevents you from breathing or, or, or speaking uh, moistly on them. Oh, what a terrible image. That prevents you from speaking moistly, speaking moistly. However, in the midst of the chaos that is COVID-19, it's important to understand what wet market really means. Otherwise, we see misconceptions and racist shit like this. Where Canadian singer Brian Adams blamed COVID-19 on some f***ing bat eating, wet market animal selling, virus making greedy bastards. But the thing is, eating bats and other wildlife is also an uncommon practice in China and other Asian countries, usually reserved for the wealthy elite. As China's specialist at Environmental Investigation Agency, Aaron White points out, although most wet markets don't sell live wild animals, the terms wet market and wildlife market are often conflated. And we actually see wet markets all across the globe, with wet referring to the puddles of water from the ice used to keep meat and seafood fresh. The synonym for wet market in Canada, America, and most of Europe is farmer's market. So for the time being, let's focus specifically on wildlife markets. These markets, which sell wild animals for pets, medicine, or food, provide the ideal conditions in which zoonotic coronaviruses can be spread. By keeping wild animals from remote habitats spanning continents in nature in filthy, overcrowded conditions, in such close quarters that bodily fluids, including feces, urine, pus, and blood from one cage spill down into those below, and by handling them in stress-inducing matters that compromise their immune systems. Yeah, stress is also shitty for our immune systems. You know what decreases stress and should be legal globally? Cannabis. An essential service in Canada. Our home and native land. I think we can all understand the anger towards these markets and the horrific, nightmarish ways in which they treat animals. I think of this place as a torture chamber and a filthy laboratory all mixed into one. But the truly horrifying reality is that these conditions, which can be divided into two components, A, the unnatural treatment, and B, the cruel treatment, of animals, both of which can cause animal to human infectious diseases. While combined in Chinese wildlife markets are in no way exclusive to China. One example of the way we've treated animals unnaturally includes feeding meat and bone meal, MBM, that contain the remains of cattle who spontaneously developed the disease or scrapey infected sheep products to cows, which led to mad cow disease. So forcing meat, and specifically cannibalism 
on a herbivorous species, which could be considered an extreme or isolated event. But the unnatural treatment of animals can be seen in a human activity which takes place around the world. Deforestation. Studies have found that nearly one in three outbreaks of new and emerging diseases are linked to land use change like deforestation. When we disturb the natural sphere and rob species of their habitats, we set off a chain of reactions. The way in 1997, slash and burn deforestation led to a haze of smoke which covered most of Southeast Asia. This haze, which was exacerbated by drought, led to a decrease in fruit production by trees. The fruit bats that had been dependent on those trees left the forest, finding fruit in cultivated orchards, which happened to be co-located with piggeries. And that is how the Nipah virus was transmitted from bats, a natural reservoir virus host, due to their unique immune systems as flying mammals to pigs, an ideal intermediate host susceptible to both avian and mammalian viruses, to ultimately humans. And this is just one transmission chain. According to National Geographic, 60% of new infectious diseases in humans, including HIV and Ebola, were transmitted to us from other animals, mostly wildlife that dwell in forests. And while the way in which these viruses emerged vary, the common denominator is human activity. As science writer David Quammen states, we humans are so abundant and so disruptive on this planet. We're cutting the tropical forests. We're building work camps in those forests and villages. We're eating the wildlife. You go into a forest and you shake the trees, literally and figuratively, and viruses fall out. As for the cruel treatment of animals, we actually needn't look further than our farms. Animal husbandry has mirrored our societal and technological evolution. With the move towards mass production that came with the Industrial Revolution, it almost seems inescapable that agriculture would be, well, industrialized. Industrial or intensive farms, also known as concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, or commonly referred to as factory farms, are defined as agricultural operations where animals are kept and raised in confined situations with no grass or other vegetation in the confinement area during the normal growing season for at least 45 days in a one-year period. Increasingly, farms look less and less like this, with a picturesque red barn and little animals frolicking about, and more like this, prisons of metal and concrete. probably no longer has a farm. Foster Farms has many farms. And while the industrialization of agriculture has undeniably sucked for small-scale farmers, as well as the animals. How do you respond to allegations that factory farming is torture or cruel or like a terrifying movie about some strange dystopian society, but in this monster story, the horrifying monsters are us? This industrialization has also sucked for us in terms of public health. One crucial factor which has enabled the sheer scale of CAFOs has also increased the transmission of infectious diseases from animals to humans. The advent of antibiotics. When animals are perceived as production units, they're crammed into overcrowded spaces so as to maximize the number of units per square foot. And when animals are kept in overcrowded, unsanitary conditions, often surrounded by their own bodily fluids, yeah, See a pattern here? They're going to get sick. So in order to control production diseases and to increase weight and thereby profit, antibiotics, which should only be used to treat the sick and to save lives, are used as production tools. And the problem is that a constant exposure to low dose antibiotics leads to the spread of superbugs, such as salmonella, strains of diseases that have evolved to grow, to grow used to and no longer respond to antibiotics. Science has proven again and again since 1945 that the sub-therapeutic use of antibiotics, taking antibiotics when you don't need them, leads to antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which is horrifying in that it could take our society backwards to a time when we die of a simple infection because we no longer have effective antibiotics. It's estimated that over 700,000 people die from antibiotic-resistant infections from superbugs. And this death toll is expected to jump to 10 million by 2050. 
the most diabolical villain, could not design a better system for creating superbugs than the modern CAFO. If you've designed a system that requires a constant input of antibiotics to keep animals from getting sick, then that system's broken. This is not to say that the practice of eating meat in itself is the root of the problem. If hypothetically the global demand for tofu were to be ramped up and we still continue to clear Amazon rainforest in order to farm soy, though most of soy production is intended for feed for farm animals and for energy, we'd still be f The real problem is a way in which we consume. Honestly, everything, which can be traced back to our tendencies as a society to perceive nature as a commodity, as something to be exploited for financial gain. And the saddest part of all of this is that it's not so much cruelty as it is apathy. Mm. And the craziest part of all of this is that the alarm bells had been sounding for years that epidemiologists, ecologists, and Bill fucking Gates himself had tried to warn us that this was coming. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. And we didn't listen. But maybe we can find the time to listen now. Dr. Jane Goodall has been promoting the conservation of animals and nature for over half a century. And her message has never been more urgent. It's a time for reflection and thinking about the part we want to play in the future of our planet. We need to reimagine how we choose to occupy this planet as humans, not as a rabble of different races, but as a single species. So, what now? What are some concrete steps we can take? The knee-jerk response is to outlaw wet markets in Asia. But the funny counterproductive effect of making certain activities illegal is that it often doesn't stop the illicit activity, instead making them unsafe as with abortion, or giving rise to black markets as with alcohol during prohibition or with drugs. And I don't know about you, but I really doubt that the black market is going to make conditions any safer or more hygienic for animals. And beyond the animals, there is a real human cost to knee-jerk bans on these kinds of markets. Accordingly, the WHO has suggested that farmers markets, or wet markets, often were critical to providing food and livelihoods for millions of people globally, and that authorities should focus on improving them rather than outlawing them. What we need to do is increase regulation to limit the use of antibiotics in agriculture and the use of animals in traditional medicines, to increase the standards in which farm animals are kept, to instill food safety laws in markets all around the world, and to combat wildlife trafficking. And if we in Western countries think that wildlife trafficking is a foreign problem, I missed the part where that's my problem. We would do well to remember that the areas with the highest export and demand for wildlife and wildlife products include the US and the European Union. No matter what, the struggle against infectious diseases to slow the spread and minimize the impact of pandemics must be a global, unified approach. In an increasingly globalized world, borders become increasingly meaningless, especially when infected people can remain asymptomatic for up to 24 days, like with COVID-19. As global health expert Alana Sheikh points out, we can't stop the outbreaks with quarantine or travel restrictions. Even the countries that have made serious investments in public health, like the US and South Korea, can't get that kind of restriction in place fast enough to actually stop an outbreak instantly. The real way for the long haul to make outbreaks less serious is to build the global health system to support core healthcare functions in every country in the world so that all countries, even poor ones, are able to rapidly identify and treat new infectious diseases as they emerge. We need to learn to work together. We need to give a shit about one another. And since the world's leading superpower and the emerging superpower have both been preoccupied with geopolitics and trade wars and 
pointing f fingers at one another. It's up to us. So much for the alliance. Wait, is that good or bad? Good? I know it's scary. I can empathize with the fear and the instinct to look for someone to blame. And how much easier all of this would be if COVID-19 had originated in a lab instead of through our collective choices as a species. But let's hear these words from Dr. Jane Goodall and really listen. And I hope it wakes us up. This is a chance for us to wake up. What we need to do in order to slow the spread and to minimize the casualties of future outbreaks is to work together and to treat one another with empathy and equity. And what we need to learn from the origin of COVID-19, if we'd like to reduce the frequency with which coronaviruses transfer from other species to humans, is to extend that same empathy and respect towards our fellow animals and our one and only planet. Hello, fellow humans. My name's Tara. Is it weird to introduce myself at the end of the video? No. I am a Korean-Canadian writer and cosplayer currently living in Japan. So, 감사합니다. 아리가토 고자이마스. 샤샤. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so, so grateful if you made it through this 5,000 word video essay. If you'd like to tell me I'm a dumb Asian slunt, you can do so on Twitter. And if you'd like to hang out in real time, you can join me on Twitch, where I live stream every Monday and Wednesday night, Eastern time. There's a lot of researching, fact checking, what I'd like to think are healthy debates, and nerding out in general. And last but not least, you can become an ally against anti-Asian racism by listening to and amplifying Asian voices in person and on social media, by learning about the history of Asians and Pacific Islanders in your country, by taking out your phone to record, speaking up against, and or reporting anti-Asian harassment or violence when you see it, by volunteering to escort the elderly, by supporting Asian-owned businesses, by donating to organizations like the Asian Pacific Fund, and, perhaps most importantly, by voting for political leaders who don't normalize xenophobia. Let's keep one another, and thereby ourselves, safe. Until next time, fist bump. A nationwide review conducted by ABC News has identified at least 54 criminal cases where Trump was invoked in direct connection with violent acts, threats of violence, or allegations of assault. Did I mention this is going to be a fun stream? Yeah, I don't think there's time for a game. Unless I play chess. Also, I would love to learn shogi.